Does the idea of tapping into God's power sound attractive to you? It does to me. In our message, we are going to see how God uses his word to bring his power into our lives. How do I find the strength I need to fight my battles? Where do I turn when I'm feeling worn out and anxious? Will reading the Bible really help? What does baptism mean for my life? Does Holy Communion strengthen me? If you've ever asked these questions and others like them, you're not alone. The emotional and spiritual battles are real. Find strength in Jesus. He wants to unleash His power in your life. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Hi, my name is Dan Slow. I'm the senior pastor at Crosswalk Church in Phoenix, Arizona. And I'd like to welcome you as we begin a new message series this week. It's called Unleashed, Experiencing the Power of God. And when I hear that, the, that theme of being unleashed and today looking at God's word and how it works, it makes me think of a couple different Bible passages. One of them is from Romans chapter 1, uh, where the apostle Paul says that, that God's word, that, that power, he's not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of salvation for everyone who believes. And a second verse I think of is from Paul's letter to Timothy as he's writing from prison and he says, I'm chained here in prison, but God's word is not chained. And when I think of that, the power of God which cannot be chained and that power that God has for our lives, it's something that I find interesting and attractive and, and even desirable for my life. And I have to believe that, that it's desirable for yours as well. So today, as we look at that power of God, we're, we're going to see the connection that it has uh, to God's word. So what role does God's word and the teachings of Jesus play uh, in my relationship with God and, and with this power? We're going to be looking at John chapter 6, but before that, I just want to take you on a little journey through the Bible. And, and it's going to show how God's word has always been the central part of his people's lives. And so we're going to go a couple different places. First of all is John chapter 1. Uh, John chapter 1, we're going to be looking at 6 later, but in John chapter 1, John writes, In the beginning was the Word. And so what, what John is doing is he's going back all the way to creation. Uh, that, and it's in verse 3, when in the beginning God said, let there be light, and there was light. And what John is saying is that the word was there. God showed his power, the power of creation, by speaking. And so the power of God has always been closely connected to his word. So he says, in the beginning was the word, but now he goes on and says, and the word was with God, and the word was God. As we look through the pages of the Bible, we realize that he's talking about the second person of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all there in the very first verses of Genesis chapter 1. So he, he, he starts there and he says the Word's always been part of this. But then in verse 14 of, of John chapter 1, John writes this, The Word became flesh. So now the Word, the second person of the Trinity, he, he takes us from creation to Christmas. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. So see this connection between the second person of the Trinity. It, it's saying he's also the Word of God. And this is also Jesus who has come into the world. Now I take you to a, a, a little different portion, and this is Moses when he's talking to the children of Israel right before they go into the promised land, and this is what he says. 
he says to the children of Israel, he humbled you. So God humbled you. God humbled the children of Israel, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known. And this is huge to teach you that man does not live on bread, on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. You might recognize those words. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord because Jesus quoted this verse in his life when he was being tempted by Satan. And again, in the midst of this, that God now is that is making this connection, his word, and, and his word, which is his son, but now he's also saying it's something, this word is something that you eat. That in the same way that you would have a, a hunger for food, that we have this hunger that only God's word can satisfy. And then finally, this is all brought together in the words we're going to be talking about in John chapter 6. And this is when John writes, this is the bread that came down from heaven. And he's referring to, to Jesus uh, uh, when he says this, your ancestors ate manna and died. Referring to that Deuteronomy one, right? You had manna, you were hungry, and God gave you to eat. They ate that physical food and died. But whoever feeds on this bread Whoever feeds on the, the word of God, whoever f feeds on Jesus, whoever feeds and believes these teachings will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. <sighs> That's a lot. What I, what I just summarized is, is what had been taught in the Jewish faith over 2,000 years. And it was always this connection between God and his word. And if you want the power of God, his word is always going to be a part of that. And Jesus adds another layer to it by saying, I'm also, it's not only that I'm the word, but I'm also the bread that you eat. If you want the power of God, if you want to be nourished by God, we even say, right, you are what you eat. That he's saying, bring the teachings of God, the truths of God, is where the power of God is, is found. And if you want that power of God in your life, don't look any farther than his word. Don't look any farther than Jesus because that is where the power of God is seen clearly. Now that having been said, and Jesus again laying all of this out, in, in verse 60, this is what it says, On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? Understand that as you hear God's word, a question that I ask people as they begin Bible study is this. Do you believe the more you get to know God, the more you will like him? Or do you think as you get to know God better, you, you'll maybe not like him so much? And almost everybody, almost everybody says, I think the more I get to know God, the more I will, will like him. And I'm just saying that the children of Israel, that in Jesus' ministry, he established his ministry. The second year of his ministry was by far people, so many crowds came around him. He was so popular. But by his third year of ministry, the more they got to know him, the less they liked him. And the reason why is they found his teachings offensive, that, that Jesus said things that, that were hard to hear. And, and I think you need, that I need to, to understand this, that God does not think like I think. In Isaiah 55, Isaiah writes this, uh, and, and it's God speaking, that, um, that your words are not my words, your ways are not my ways. As the, high, the heavens are above the earth, so, so much are my ways and my thoughts above your thoughts. And so this is the first thing we need to understand is God doesn't think like we do. Looking at history, I would say that during the time of Jesus and during the time of Greek and Roman culture, 
they believed that the gods were like them, only greater, and, and that they were superhuman. And so you would have people like Hercules, you would have these, these marble statues of, of the gods that were just perfect, just perfect physical specimens, and they would say, those are what the gods are. They're just like us, only better. In our culture today, I, I don't think people would say that. I, I think they look at that as that's mythology and, and, and things of that nature. But what our culture does say is not that God looks like me, but I think God thinks like me. And if, and if there is a teaching that I don't agree with, that, that, that you know, my logic, uh, that, that it goes against it, I, I find that offensive and I'm going to turn from God. And this is the warning. These are words of warning and law for each one of us that God doesn't think like we do. And understand the more and more that you get to know about God and what he says. And these people specifically, what did they not want to accept? That they were sinful. They, they didn't, it, it went against their ears to hear that their, their sin would lead them to hell. They, that they hated that concept. They hated the thought that, that Jesus was their savior or that Jesus would even be the son of God. And that's why it says here that, does this offend you? Then what if you see the son of man ascend to where he was before? He's saying, you might not like this teaching that I'm true God, but what's gonna happen once I ascend to heaven and go back and you see me in all my glory again? And, and he's telling them, if you can't accept this, uh, you don't understand the power of God. You don't understand who, who Jesus is. And so a word of warning for you. As you go and you want to experience the power of God, which is found in his word, through which he changes hearts and lives and, and brings about eternal change, understand that what's going to need to change is you. It's me. It's the way that we think and even our, our, our idea of what we have of God in our head needs to be changed by his word and what he says. Going on, uh, Jesus says, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. Once again, Jesus is, is talking to them and he, and he He's telling them, you're getting wrapped up in this whole idea of Moses and the manna and, and, and all that was physical. That he's telling them, not that it didn't happen and not that it wasn't important, but you have to understand that God was trying to teach them a lesson of humility and obedience. And ultimately, God was using a physical lesson to teach a spiritual truth, which is, you need me, you need God, you need my words, you need to, to follow this. These are what give life. And specifically, what gave life was the message that that sin problem that we have has been, we have been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. The, the message is law and gospel, law showing our sin and our need for a savior, that we can't do it alone, that we are not good enough. But the gospel, that, that the word became flesh, that, that Jesus came into this world, that God came into this world, Emmanuel, to be one of us, to live his life perfectly, not to show us how to do it, but as our substitute. And so when we, we look to the cross, when, when we look to the resurrection, the ascension, and, and one day Jesus' return, we recognize that he is the Son of God, that he is our Savior, and it's the Holy Spirit working through the power of the word that helps us to see this truth and bring life. Jesus goes on, Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say this, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. We're not talking about new people 
that, that heard this message that said, I, I don't want to be part of your church. I don't want to be part of your following. No, these are ones who said they were Jesus' disciples. These are individuals who said, yeah, we want to follow you. Uh, we find you very attractive, what you're teaching, uh, very attractive. And then all of a sudden, it, as it got closer and closer to realizing what this meant, the, the impending death of Jesus, talking about his death and resurrection, they didn't want to have anything to do with it. And I think it's important for us to understand that, uh, that God's word is powerful and effective not just when people believe it, but it's also effective in, in exposing unbelief when people don't believe it. That it becomes obvious to them that they are, are not followers of, of Christ, that they are uh, in unbelief. And one of the, the Old Testament pictures that, that God used of this truth was rain. That in the same way that, that he says that rain comes down from heaven and, and doesn't go back until it's accomplished the purpose for which it's given, so is the word that comes out of my mouth. It always uh, brings about the, the purpose for which it was given. And so some rain that comes down is absorbed by plants. It, it di- does bring about growth. But some water also goes into the, uh, the road, into the ditches, into the alleys. It, it has a cleaning, I guess, power to it. But it's always effective. And so is God's word. It's just this, this truth that it, it, it is powerful both in bringing faith and exposing unbelief. So when all this is going on, now it goes from the, this bigger picture to a smaller picture where Jesus is talking to the 12 disciples. So Jesus had a lot of disciples, but now we get down to the 12. You do not want to leave me too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One from God. Wow. I, I think this is, this is just so, in so many ways, it's one of my favorite portions of God's word where, where Peter is watching people leave and, he, and he's watching them go to other things. And, and so where are the other places that people go instead of Jesus? They can go to science. They can go to knowledge or what they perceive as wisdom. They can go to uh, things of of this world. They could go to things like uh, miracles or maybe even just go to self. I'm going to be my own God. I'm going to believe whatever it is that I want to believe. But but Peter, I, I think, shows a certain wisdom when he just asks the question, where else are we going to go? That he, he realized every other place that he would go, every other religion that he would go to ultimately points you back to yourself and says there's a problem and you're going to have to fix it. But Jesus was the only one who brought the truth of God's word. The message that that I think we all know is true, that we have sinned, that we fall short of God's standard, but also that God has brought a remedy to that, a remedy to it in Christ. There is no other place to go. There is no other gospel message like this. And it's found in the word of God. It is the word of God. It's through which the Holy Spirit works. And it is the words about Jesus. It is the good news about Jesus. And the final verse that that I have that I I was just, I didn't know which which one to choose. I I was thinking uh, that faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ, which is also in Romans. But instead, the one I like is Hebrews 4 verse 12. That's where I, I landed today. And that is, the word of God is alive and active. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. And what I like about that is is it makes me realize, and I've, you know, the experience that I have is that God's word is like a a, a scalpel doing surgery on us. 
that he comes and, and it's just, he judges the thoughts and attitude of the heart. God cuts through so many different issues and ultimately takes us to where we need to be, which is standing before God, uh, exposed, honest, uh, looking at us, getting a clear view of who we are. No more reasons, no more facades, but God sees us clearly as we are and his word does that. That word as he does delicate surgery on us, revealing sin, but also like a delicate surgery, bringing healing, uh, removing the cancer, getting it out so that healing can take place. And that is the power we still have for God's word today. Make no doubt about it, it is, uh, it is alive, it is active. In the same way that Jesus was alive and active, he's still alive and active in our lives today. And so understand as you look for the power of God that, that it is still found in his word through which the Holy Spirit both starts faith and strengthens faith. And this doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for two weeks, two years, 20 years, 80 years, that it's still the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. And that power is something we can enjoy today. So my encouragement as you go from here today is have a regular daily opportunity to be in that word uh, through a Bible study. And as you look at ways that you live it too, that we live and do, uh, that this is God's plan to bring his power to your life. Let's pray. Uh, dear Lord God, we thank you that you are the word who came into this world. We, we thank you that you are God, you are the word, and you are also the bread that we eat. And, and it's such a beautiful picture, Lord, that, that we go to you uh, on a regular basis, on a daily basis to, re, to receive strength uh, and, and strength to live a Christian life. And now, Lord, as we go from here, please give us the self-discipline to, to go to you every day and, and to tap into that power which you have for us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.